Welcome to another episode of Strictly Legal on WESN Content Capital. I am your host, Rondel Donoa, attorney at law. And welcome once again. Of course, this show um, speaks about the law and you, as well as featuring lawyers who have done a lot of work and a lot of service to this country. Uh, you can also stream on www.wesncc.com, as well as all of our platforms. Now, going straight into the program, I am so excited because, of course, on the previous episode, I would have spoken to one Miss Corinne Prokop um, about her transition into law and insight into her journey um, as a chartered accountant um, and now pursuing law um, to be called to the bar shortly. Uh, in this episode, I'll be continuing the transition into law discussion, but this time a look inside. And I have a very interesting young man, a guest who is not the ordinary course in which he would have gone in terms of pursuing law right away. He's actually fluent in Spanish. Um, he's a linguist, a uh, translator, and uh, he's a past student of St. Mary's College, of course, my alma mater, so I have to big it up, big, big up the, the, the college. And his, he goes by the name of Colin Dinoon. He's an attorney at law by profession in independent practice. I won't read out his bio. Uh, because I want him to chat with you and uh, expressing his journey. And of course, uh, his journey is one of inspiration. And I'm sure a lot of attorneys, young attorneys and persons who are like-minded um, would be very interested to hear his discussion. So we go straight into it. Colin Dinoon, good morning. Good morning, Rondell. It's a pleasure to be here. Good morning to you and your viewers. Thank you so much for, for gracing us with your presence virtually. And we do, uh, I do appreciate um, you coming on board. So, Mr. Dinoon. Thank you. So, um, so nice to be here. So, Mr. Dinoon, tell us, who is Colin Dinoon? I'm, on the line, I'm a young attorney at law. Um, I'm presently in private practice in San Fernando. Um, practice in the areas of criminal law, family law, estate planning generally. And I also offer advice to business owners who may be considering what are their options in terms of company formation or um, I also provide contract drafting services and review. Good. So I know that you would have done a first degree, right, in language arts. Okay. Uh, you are a, you are fluent in Spanish. Yeah. Right. So tell us, is it that you always wanted to be um, to do languages. Tell us how is it that you came about uh, pursuing a degree in Spanish? Well, from the time I was a child, um, I came from a sort of law enforcement background. My mother was a police officer. She unfortunately passed away more than two years ago. And my dad was a, um, a member of the Petrician Security um, Department. So that, that whole idea of law and order was, was part of my bringing together with I have an uncle who was also a very senior police officer and yes, so from the time I was a child them. I had an inclination to get involved in the law and also um, given the fact that you know my mom would share different stories and so on and but when I applied to go to university law was my first choice and Spanish was my second choice unfortunately I was given my second choice and my parents advised me to to go fit, you know, to continue with my second choice, and then I would make the switch. Yes. However, I fell in love with Spanish, and it's something I call my accidental love, because I, I got so into it that I even worked in, in that field for a year, but I didn't give up on my dream. You know, my dream was to be an attorney, and I didn't give up on that dream. So you worked in, in you, you said you worked in the field, um, the Spanish field, for a year. And this yes. is at the, uh, the embassy of Argentina, or the, uh, you, you explained to us what, what, what exactly you did. Yeah, well, I was employed at the embassy of the Argentine Republic um, for a period of one year as a personal assistant to the ambassador. The ambassador at that time was His Excellency Marcelo Aldo Salviolo. Yes. And he was a career diplomat. He had served in the Caribbean once before um, in Jamaica. And that was his first time being an ambassador. And my serve as a Trinidadian national, after finishing my studies, I sent out applications to various embassies at the advice of my father. Yeah, right. And lo and behold, they called me in for an interview. Right. And I was successfully chosen. 
No. My duties involve things like translating and writing speeches, accompanying them on meet meetings, doing diplomatic notes and stuff like that. Now, how was that translating experience? Because, of course, as a, as a Trinidadian and, and, and speaking, I mean, you said you, you're fluent in Spanish. I mean, we have a lot of Spanish influence here. How was that experience? But, but let's, let's, let's look at a photo. Now, I, let's pull up the, the photo where you, um, where you worked with the uh, ambassador there. Yes, that is you as a, what, what year was that? That was in 2013, so that would have been my first Argentina National Day okay. after having now. Um, Started back to study. So after I started my studies, they reinvited me to their national league. And then you have the Argentine flag and the Trinidad Tobago flag in the background. That's correct. That photo was taken at the Hyatt Regency Hotel. Oh, good. Yeah, it, it looks like that. Right. So let's let's get back to you. So tell us what. Yeah. Um, as, as I was asking, how was that experience in the in in working as a personal assistant translator in, in an embassy as a Trinidadian um, national? It was a very intense working environment. Um, my ambassador was very efficient. Our working hours were seven hours a day, so we worked from nine to four. Okay. But as you would imagine, given that it was less time, it had to be more, you know, there was, there was more pressure. Right. And my ambassador never liked to leave work to roll over to the other day, right. the next day. So it would, it would always be intense. And um, also, I have to credit the, the, the training I would have received at the University of the West Indies and also at secondary school level that would have prepared me and given me that foundation upon which to build. Yes. So words I didn't know, I, I would have simply researched them and continually added to my vocabulary as I went along. But I had a strong foundation. And you, you stated previously that you would have done this for a year? Yes. And then so, thereafter, thereafter, that is when you decided to pursue law. Yeah, because my, my dad was telling me, you know, don't get comfortable in that job, you know. Um, you know, you want to be an attorney, so apply. And also my, my mother as well, she kept on encouraging me not to give up on my dream. So I would have applied to the University of Cable, University of the West Indies Cable Campus, yes. and I was successful. And um, my parents supported me tremendously um, financially and so on throughout my studies, and even, even emotionally and, and so on, you know, with the different challenges along the way, my friends and family. Yes. Were tremendously me. Now, in terms of that transition, of course, you have been studying in Barbados, that's it, Kivil, Barbados. And yes. that transition from a working environment with a, with a language background to law. Uh, yeah. How was that transition for you? It, it was challenging at first mm -hmm. because it's a totally different area of study. Uh, you know, even at university, I didn't only do Spanish, right? I would have done international relations and linguistics as a minor. Right. So I had that element of social science training, but it wasn't the same in terms of law and having to do, you know, read cases and, and analyze cases and so on. And also I found that in Kivel, being a regional student myself, I found myself having a greater appreciation for lessons from other islands and territories, learning of their cultures and so on. Because sometimes when we are in Trinidad here, yeah, you know, we are in the majority. Yes. And we tend to take it for granted. Yes. But when you're in a situation you know, where you are an external student, you know, you're forced to embrace everyone. So um, that was really my experience. That camaraderie and that teamwork helped yes. me um, through my, my time as a student. And, okay, you've, you've completed your, your undergraduate, that was in 2016. Right. And then you would have, been, you would have now transferred to Hewitting to do your law school. That's correct. At any time during your law program, did you, did you do any law, let's say, translation in terms of a Spanish elective or, or anything like that to use your Spanish background in law? Well, during my time at law school, I didn't do it officially, but unofficially, I kept up with my Spanish. So, for example, I would read, um, I went to Colombia as part of an exchange program in the year 2010. Yes. And I still have friends in that country. They find that I would keep up with their news. You know, I would read El Tiempo, which is the Colombian national newspaper. I would also do listening. And um, I had a great teacher, Mr. Westmas, who also encouraged me to keep up with, with my language skills and my uncle as well. Oh, yeah, Mr. So Westmas from present. Unofficially, I kept up with the, with the skills, you know? 
and and you would have been called to the bar in 2018, not so? 2018. And um, now, now tell us what um what experience did you have um going into private practice because you're in private practice now. Yes. So what what I'm experience you had? From, from well, I, my experience in terms of employment was brief. Um, I worked at Mr. Garcia's Law Chambers. That's Kerwin Garcia. Period of time, Mr. Kerwin Garcia. Yes. And I would describe that experience as a legal boot camp. You know, not in a bad way, but it really stretched me as an attorney. I mean, we worked a lot of hours. We did a lot of in interesting research projects. And it really laid a solid foundation for me to be able to be on my own, you know, because it requires such a tremendous amount of discipline and tenacity. And of those course. skills were honed yes. while I was at, in Mr. Gaspar's employ. And you took, a, you, you, took, uh, you took a risk because, you know, normally when you get called to the bar, a lot of persons look for employment. A lot of young attorneys oh. look for employment. It's very hard. It's, it's, it's very rare that you would find an attorney leaving um, or going into to, um, to practice, private practice, as soon as they get called to the bar. Yeah. Because, I mean, this, yeah. was the, this was the same with me. Uh, so tell me, what, what yeah. compelled you to, to get into private practice, taking that risk of, of starting from scratch rather than getting the experience from a law chamber or a law firm? You know, Rana, when I came out from law school, um, I think like most young law graduates who are just graduating and, um, you know, being called to the bar, especially persons who would have done very well academically. Yes. I was under the impression that I would be able to achieve employment for sure. You know, mm -hmm. I was under the impression that I just had to send out a couple of resumes and um, people would be beating down my door. And I say that humbly, of course. Yes. Um, but that, that wasn't the case. You know, I found that a lot of applications went unanswered. A lot of applications would, came back with feedback that, you know, we will we'll keep you on file or nothing is available. And um, based upon that, I decided that I, I would try, give it a try. Because I was also, I also have a friend in Point Fortin mm -hmm. who has a practice in Tobago as well. Right. And while I was home contemplating what to do, I spent some time with him. And he was in private practice as a young attorney. Mm -hmm. And based on that experience, I said, you know what? I could give it a try. And um, that was really my impetus, you know, the failure to obtain employment and being exposed to that private practice lifestyle. Colin, we have to take a break and we'll be right back with more. You are watching WESN Content Capital Strictly Legal. I'm Andy Johnson. Welcome to this edition of 10 Questions. And, and the intent of, of why these commissions were set up has been undermined to a significant extent by the explosion of contract work in the public service. In the same way as you have the Commissioner of Police uh, strutting about the fact that he is independent and he is not uh, beholden to anybody, particularly any politician, is that not a similar kind of situation with whoever occupies the position of the Central Bank? He needs to be very, to have a policy that allows him to establish clearly how these children got on the board. The black people are at the heart of the PNM, and as the heart of the PNM, they should make demands upon the system. What's in this for us? Andy Johnson has 10 questions, Fridays, 10 a.m., right here on WESN. I welcome to you guys. Yes, we are ready to start this show. Cup of Joe is fun. Cup of Joe is food. Joel, I just here for the food. Eh? Yeah. I just. <laughs> but before your sample, right? <laughs> yeah. Cup of Joe is friends. Nice one, look, we got up down on us. Cup of Joe is on every Wednesday at five on WESN Content Capital. Kaya Scott and join me here every Wednesday at 10 a.m. for one-on-one -on -one season two on WESN Content Capital. 
One on One is that show where we're going to have meaningful and difficult conversations on topics that we usually shy away from. So don't forget, every Wednesday at 10 a.m., One on One Season 2 on WESN Content Capital. Welcome back to Strictly Legal on WESN Content Capital. We are speaking with my guest, Mr. Colin De Noon, attorney at law, on his transition into law. A look inside. So, Colin, before the break, we were chatting about private practice. And as we know, yes. private practice can be tough, but yes. it's how you make of it and what connections that you do. Now, tell us what is the key to a successful time in, in private practice as a young attorney? I believe the key is personal organization, you know, because like any entrepreneur, a, a, so an attorney in private practice needs to be a self-starter. Yes. You know, you need to figure out your own um, preferences. Do you work best in the morning? Do you work best at night? Um, have a schedule, right? That's your foundation. Um, personal organization, practice organization in terms of knowing where everything is, a proper filing system, yes. you know, accounting system and all of that. And, and your knowledge of the law, and also having contacts with other attorneys and persons in other areas of society. And, and of course, time management, because that is important as you run your own life, you run your own practice. Yeah, yes, of course. That would be a corollary to have in you know, your personal organization. You must have good time management skills. Now, as, as someone with a Spanish background, how are you using that skill set? into your practice because we have a lot of spanish speakers here and i'm sure obviously you have to stand out from the crowd so tell us have you been using that background in your practice so far i have been able to use it directly uh, with a client that i had who, who was of venezuelan nationality um, and she couldn't speak any english at all so when i would well, it was a criminal matter so when i would go to the the prisons of visit and so on, I would be in a position where I could have um, communicated with her directly as opposed to having to wait for a translator to be assigned. So that was really a, a great plus. And I felt that, you know, the client felt more comfortable dealing with someone who could speak her language and had an understanding of, of their culture, you know? So I believe that was a, a great plus. I know um, there was a question when I, when I did the promo for you uh, that one would have asked, why not get into law enforcement translation? As, as, as an attorney? Is that something that you've considered? Well, not directly. I haven't directly considered it. Um, because, you know, I, I like the cut and thrust of advocacy. I like to be in the ring, so to speak, you know. So being a, a formal translator as such hasn't appealed to me. Right. However, I am desirous. I do have a deep desire to. Um, to transmit my knowledge in terms of, of Spanish, you know, because I believe I've been incredibly blessed yes. as a, a non-native speaker to achieve such a high level in Spanish. And one of the things I would like to do is to give back. You know, if I have that opportunity, I would like to, to do something in that regard, to pass on the knowledge that I have um, attained. And maybe, and maybe it's a way in terms of your private practice to stand out, as I said, um, with that background. Uh, to use that in order to, to, to motivate okay. others, in order to, uh, um, to, to hone other skills. Of course, of course. No, you know, because it is, it is a valuable skill in this um, climate where we have so many Venezuelan nationals. Yes. You no, know, it really, really is a valuable skill. You know? No, no, you I, are... I would encourage people to go there. No, I you... would encourage people to go there to also, yes. um, you know, learn Spanish if they can. Now, you are, uh, let, let's turn to another aspect of your career. You are a writer. That's correct. Now, I have followed you on, on the professional profile, um, um, LinkedIn, LinkedIn. And you sometimes post very motivational um, uh, stories, or you would post um, tips to a successful practice, to a successful life. Now, tell us about your writing, because I know you have a blog. Right. Yeah, I publish my writing on the Medium website, 
Yes. Um, so my website will be colandinone.medium.com. And on that page, I basically write things relating to, some of it relates to the law, some of it is social commentary, and some of it relates to motivation and faith. Yes. And I use my LinkedIn profile as a way of adding value to other people. Because I've realized that I have been benef- a beneficiary of, of the posts and, and, and the engagement of other persons. Yep. So when I get ideas, I tend to show it, to share it, you know, so that it can serve as a, as a motivation to other persons who may be law students or entrepreneurs or other attorneys in private. And I think one of the posts that you made, I think it was a day ago, which, which really resonated with me, and it stated, be open to feedback and constructive criticism, but avoid negative people who try to ridicule and destroy your God-given vision. That is profound, though. Of course. Of course. And tell us what, amazing, what incited brother. that. Um, can you repeat? What incited you to, 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 to write that um, particular, particular sentence? Yeah, it's amazing that the, my inspiration to post sometimes come, comes at the most inopportune times. Yes. You know, and many times it, it's as a result of my own thought process, please, you know, me reflecting on certain life experiences that I may have had and um, really coming up together with a two or, or, sh- or three lines um, sentence that really encapsulates that thought. And in my experience, I have found that, you know, sometimes there are persons who Maybe negative persons who may have tried to discourage me. Yes. And I, um, I have to be able to sift, you know, between what is constructive criticism and what is really someone who is really trying to, um, you know, rain on my parade, so to speak. Correct. And, and then, and then on another, on, on another post, you will have, spoke, you will have spoken about uh, the don't underestimate the power of generating your brand awareness. And I think that is important in your life as a private practitioner and as, as a writer. Of course. People have to know you exist, Rondell. Yes. You know, people need to know that we exist. And um, that LinkedIn is a powerful platform for achieving that. And one of the things that I notice with LinkedIn as well is that it's also a way to form a global network. Correct. You know, because yes, the attorneys in Trinidad and Tobago, but to LinkedIn, I've been able to connect with persons on the African continent, persons in the United States, locally and in the region. So it's really a great um, platform to really connect with persons all over the world. And like I said, generate that brand awareness. Let people know who you are and what you do. Now, Colin, I mean, you also have another side of you. You are, you are a singer. <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> I'm a member of the Supreme Open Bible. A church choir. Right. So I sing the tennis, you know. So that is also as one side of me. And then I'm also in, I'm a fitness enthusiast. Okay. So I hike with a training track um, club. And I do running as well. Oh, you do running as well. So you train other, you train other persons? No, just recreationally. I, I present as I'm in San Fernando. I go to Skinner Park a couple of times for the week and I make some laps. And do other, um, you know, push ups and sit ups and stuff. Yes. Like just to keep, you know. So you're multi talented. You, you, you have a, a language background, attorney at law, singer, motivational uh, writer. Yeah. So my t- parents, I give a lot of credit to my parents because they always encourage me to be balanced. You know, not only study, yes. but to make time for government, make time for friends, um, socialize. Stuff like that. They always inculcated that sense of balance in me, and it has really helped me thus far in my life and continues to do so. And that is very important. And of course, I know that you are very heavily involved in, 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 your, in your church, um, in the Christian community. So, is yes. that something, is, is, is this because of your spirituality you are able to be so grounded and focused on what you, what you set out to do? Well, my spirituality for me, I would say, is my moral compass. You know, we all need that North Star that guides us in, um, in difficult times. And that is what my, my spirituality does to me. You know, my Christian faith has given me certain principles that I try to live by. I mean, I, I, we, are, we are all human. Yes. And I would fall short at times, you know, but it is really that guide that really leads me along. And I'm thankful to God for, for his love for me and for all of us. Yes. You know? And I hope that we will seek to get to know him deeper and every day. Most importantly, 
And what advice do you have to give to young uh, persons who are thinking about getting into private practice? You yourself being just two or three years, your third year, is your third year into private practice. What yeah. advice do you have for other peers like yourself that are right now confused as to what to do? They, they can't be employed, they are free to get into practice. What advice do you have for them? Well, number one, I would tell them, don't be afraid. You know, fear is one of the most paralyzing forces on the face of the earth. If we are afraid, we wouldn't go out, leave our homes. Yes. You know, if we are afraid, we wouldn't launch out into a business or into a private enterprise. So we need to overcome that fear. And also, we need to get in contact with persons who are doing what we would like to do. For example, if you're an attorney out there and you would like to get into private practice, reach out to an attorney who's already doing that. Yes. So you would have that mentorship and that guide. And also, deepen your knowledge of the law, you know, because, yes, you may be in private practice, but you, you require a deep knowledge of the law, especially in the areas that you choose to practice. Agreed. Because you are the be advising the client and so on, you know. And um, also, I would say, to be humble, you know, as attorneys, we are servants. You know, we exist to serve the interests of our, of our clients. Yes. We should never forget that. We should never forget that service. And of course, the maxim, law is a jealous mistress. So research. Of course. Colin, thank yes. you so much. Time is up. And I know you do have your court matter to attend to. So thank you for joining us via yes. Virtual League um, and inspiring others because I'm sure there are so many people are inspired. I know San Fernando Mayor is locked on, Mr. Regrello, as well as your former teacher, Miss Mongol. All our teachers at St. Mary's College. Well, I'm, on, I'm so on. I'm grateful. Yes. <laughs> thank you for having me, Randall. Not a problem. And thank you for joining us. I hope that your story inspires others. Thank you. So, folks, this is a wrap. You have been watching Strictly Legal on WESN Content Capital. Your host, Rondell Donovan, saying God bless. And we are out. See you on the next episode.